Let's pray. It's Palm Sunday. I'm excited about the word. Let's dive in in just a moment. God, give us ears to hear you. God, I pray that we have a mind ready to understand. And most importantly, God, we are postured. First Peter chapter five, verse six. We are humbling ourselves today under your mighty hand. We ask God that you would lift us up or lift things off of us, distractions, things that are trying to put a lid on our growth. God, give us a heart ready and willing to receive today. If you believe us, say amen. amen. So again, today's Palm Sunday, and I'm gonna break down some deeper context, some biblical history. For those of you who are new to the faith, this is gonna be kind of exciting, like, whoa, this is why we believe what we believe. For those of you who are veterans in the faith, who have heard the Palm Sunday sermon for 25 premium years, today's a great reminder of our foundational walk as Christians. To be a Christian is simply to be Christ-like. And so today's Palm Sunday, where Christians all over the world celebrate Jesus' victorious entry into Jerusalem. And Palm Sunday is so significant in our biblical history because it reminds each and every one of us in our humanity that we need a Savior, that we cannot accomplish the work of the cross on our own. How many of y'all are grateful that you don't have to pay the tab for all of your messy situations? You should have praised God a little bit bolder than that, I'm telling you. But it's because of Jesus that our life leaves an echo here on this earth. Because of the price that he paid, there's an echo from our lives as Christians of love, joy, peace, patience, and hope. And while this is a joyful occasion, a special occasion for his followers, this event took place towards the end of Jesus' days on earth before ultimately being crucified. This, of course, led up to Thursday, the day that they arrested Jesus, and then Friday, which is the reason we're gathering to have communion and just reflect from a posture of gratitude. Friday was the day that Jesus was crucified, all leading up to a Saturday where it was silent, and those that followed him wondered, is this really going to happen? Will he really get up from the grave? And what was a silent Saturday ended up a setup for us because next Sunday, y'all, we're gonna gather and we're gonna celebrate, come on, the resurrection of Jesus and the freedom that we get to walk in because no tomb could contain the unconditional love of God that was about to be released through Jesus' life. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection really did change everything. There were so many times in the Bible where Jesus showed us the significance of who he was, not just man, not just the Son of God, but how he also lived his life as our Savior. For me personally, when I recognized who he was as my Savior, he in return told me who I am. I'm chosen by God. Come on, somebody say out loud, I'm chosen by God. <laughs> Y'all, from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted, I brag and boast all the time the night and day difference that I am, that my life looks like after I encounter Jesus. I'm a child of the most high God. I'm a miracle. If you know my story, I never should have made it. Where's all the never should have made it's at? Come on. We got a whole church full of never should have made it. I know that it's a miracle that I even have a microphone and that I have the opportunity to preach the good news. Some of y'all know my story. Almost aborted. Born into a chaotic situation. Made the Mari Povich and Jerry Springer show look like a PG cartoon. Maybe you can relate. Maybe your family was messy. Maybe you're the opposite. Maybe you only grew up watching Kirk Cameron films, Fireproof, and listening to Mercy Me. It's okay. Your story is your story. But the reality is we all are night and day different from when we encountered Jesus. And my past, y'all, is the reason that I currently know that I don't ever want a future without God. Come on, how many of y'all would say, that's my story? Come on, that's my song. So this weekend on Palm Sunday, I want to look deeper into this story and unpack some verses around the life of Jesus, what the significance of Palm Sunday is. By the way, your kids are also walking out with real palm branches, y'all. I got stuck in the eye with one a minute ago in between services. I'm like, y'all, that's not a Hobby Lobby. Plastic palm branch, that's the real deal. It's only the finest, amen. So Jesus is... He's on his way, Jesus is on his way into Jerusalem, knowing full well that this trip would end in his sacrificial death for the sin of humanity. He sent a couple of his disciples ahead to the village of Bethage, 
about a mile away from the city at the foot of the Mount of Olives, and he gave them very specific instructions and very specific directions to follow. Now, I love this, how detailed Jesus was in this moment, because, you know, these men ran and walked with Jesus everywhere. Jesus performed miracles, man. He's, he's turning water into wine. He's, he's transforming brokenness into breakthrough. He's taking blind eyes and causing them to open, and he's giving these men parables all the time, and some of them felt like riddles sometimes, like, okay, I gotta decipher. It's a little bit of a scavenger hunt with this, with this parable, but this specific set of verses, Jesus was very specific with his instruction and direction, because he knew going into Jerusalem, this journey of Holy Week, was gonna ultimately end in his sacrificial death. So we're gonna have fun, I'm gonna tell stories, we're gonna go through some moments, but my posture and my disposition is different today. Because we need to know why we believe what we believe. Because culture is trying to define what the church believes. And I believe it's time for the church to rise up and say, no, 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 the church is gonna define what culture, y'all should shout a little bit better than that. Because the truth is, we're seeing it. Culture is trying to tell the church where to say and what to say and how to say it and do. We're no longer going to bend and conform to what the culture is saying. Well, come on, somebody. I believe the Church of Jesus Christ is about to establish the culture. Heaven is going to touch earth even more than ever. All right, so Luke chapter 19 records this moment. Jesus gives very specific directions to his disciples. He says, go into the village over there. And as you enter it, you'll see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. It's pretty specific. I'm sure they're like, whoa, okay. <laughs> this is... Untie it, bring it here. And if anyone asks, why are you untying this colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. Like, I just wonder what that conversation was like. Like, we don't know which disciple, but they're like, hey, do you think there's really gonna be a donkey over there that nobody's ever ridden? Like, right around the corner by the tire shop? Like, you th <laughs> they walk around the corner, and just as Jesus said, the men found the donkey, brought it to Jesus, they placed their cloaks on the colt. Y'all, that opener that our creative team put together where the cloaks were falling on the ground and the palm branches and the donkey was walking. Y'all give it up to them. That was not something they Googled. We filmed that. That's amazing. Somebody almost got kicked by the donkey. So Jesus sits on the donkey and he slowly and humbly makes his, his entry into Jerusalem. And in his path, people begin to throw their cloaks and their palm branches on the ground on the road before him. Others picked up the branches and waved them in the air. Matthew chapter 21 records it this way, verses 9 through 11. The crowds went ahead of him. Those that follow shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, I love this line right here, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? Another translation says, who is this man? Who is this man that your guy, you guys are, you're acting, you're acting out. You're throwing things down, you're waving it like he's some sort of king? Who is this man? The crowds begin to answer back, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. There's a historical fact where a difference a day made the palm leaf ultimately developed into a symbol of peace all over the world. It's marked in our history. Shifting gears, this is by no means saying that my family is perfect, but we do try to live a life that reflects and looks like Jesus, and we all know that history repeats itself. I'm gonna speak just to the parents for a moment. They were throwing the cloaks down. They were throwing the branches down as a, as a sign of honor and submission and saying, the king has come, the, the leader has arrived, and Often days when I've had a long day at the office, I'll show up at home and I feel, this is completely out of context, but I feel sometimes when my kids throw down their clothes and all of their toys and our house is an absolute train wreck, that somehow deep within their sweet little hearts, they're doing it as a sign of honor to Jackie and I. Where's all the parents that experienced the same thing? Like, you're like, man, I almost blew an ACL out the other night on a Lego creation. Like, okay, it has nothing to do with the Bible. Let's get back to the word, amen. The crowd began to wave these palm branches as Jesus rode in to show that peace and hope had come. I love this moment because here's the truth. Maybe you came in today, maybe you're looking for hope. Maybe you're a priester, you come around Christmas and Easter. And maybe your grandma or a 
mom or a dad or a friend invited you to come on Palm Sunday because it wasn't going to be quite as busy as Easter. The great news is the same Jesus we read about that brought hope and peace then is the same Jesus that will bring hope and peace here right now for your life. And I believe that the Lord is going to reveal his presence across all of our campuses, those watching online. that You can leave the same out the same doors you walked in, filled with hope today. Because I've said this before, that if there's any area of your life that feels hopeless, it's been under the influence of a lie. Because hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. And even though maybe you're feeling the weight that's trying to cave in around you, I've got great news on Palm Sunday 2023. Again, the same Jesus that rode into Jerusalem is the same Jesus that's going to restore, heal, and deliver your family today. If you believe it, will you shout amen? I believe it. I'm claiming it for my own family. So there's all this commotion happening as Jesus is coming in. People are throwing clothes down and their palm branches. There's all this commotion happening with Jesus' entry into the city of Jerusalem. And word started spreading about the moment all throughout the city. Y'all, this is before social media. It wasn't like, hey, I'm Facebook Live, and right now, this dude everybody's calling Jesus is riding up in here on a donkey. This is No, the word is starting to spread like a game of telephone, and the Pharisees, who were the religious folks, dispersed throughout the crowd. They were jealous of Jesus, and they were afraid of what the people were shouting and proclaiming. So they said in Luke chapter 19, verses 39 and 40, the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, Rebuke your disciples. If you really dive into the, the depth of this verse, they had written him off as, yeah, a miracle worker, but maybe no more than an illusionist or a magician. Is he who he really says he is? Because they were all about the law. They were all about disrupting and keeping it very religious. That's why here at Hope City, we don't do this thing built upon religion. That's condemning and judgmental. We do this because of relationship. That you can walk with a Savior who not only likes you, but really loves you. Who's not mad at you, but is madly in love with you. And the Pharisees stirred up this religious spirit. So they say to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And I love the pushback from Jesus. He's so cool. He said, I tell you, he answered, if they remain silent, the very stones will cry out. Jesus was conveying to the Pharisees, the religious folks, that these people are longing for a savior. And if they remain silent, the very stones under their feet will cry out in desperation for a savior. What a powerful statement. All right, I want to look at a couple points of interest this morning. Welcome to Bible study. Number one, when Jesus told the disciples to go get the donkey, Jesus referred to himself as the Lord. Tell them the Lord needs it. It's the first time recorded in scripture that he referred to himself as that. It was a defining proclamation of his divinity. Number two, by riding into Jerusalem on the donkey, Jesus fulfilled, he fulfilled an ancient prophecy. If you're a student of the Bible, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, the books of the Old Testament contain many passages about the Messiah. All prophecies Jesus fulfilled. For instance, the crucifixion of Jesus was actually talked about and recorded in Psalms 22, verses 16 through 18. And this is amazing. It was a thousand years before Christ was even born. So people are watching this prophecy playing out in real time. Bible scholars suggest that there are more than 300 prophetic scriptures completed in the life of Jesus. Here's one of them. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout out loud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. That's amazing. Thanks for sharing that, Daniel. No, no, no. That prophecy was spoken hundreds of years before it actually happened. Everything that Jesus prophesied and the life and the story that were in the scrolls, Jesus walked out and fulfilled. Here's some other cool facts about Jesus. This was the only instance in the Gospels which Jesus ever rode an animal. Jesus walked everywhere teaching and performing miracles. That's why in Matthew chapter 9, verse 20, it says that the woman with the issue of blood fought her way through the crowd because Jesus was just walking by performing miracles, 
healing blind Bartimaeus, raising up people from the dead. He walked everywhere. Some of y'all don't know this, but Jesus was the creator. He was the original creator of CrossFit. But it was called Christfit, and then after the cross, it became Crossfit. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Don't clap for that. That's ridiculous. All right, on this particular, some of you are like, that's amazing. I'm gonna put that on Instagram. It's, that's not true. Okay, on this particular day, though, Jesus asked to ride in on a donkey. Why? Because in those days, anytime a king came into town to be celebrated, he would ride in on an animal like a donkey. But it even goes deeper than this. If a king rode in on a horse, it meant that they were still at war. But if a king rode in on a donkey, it meant that the war was over and peace had come. That's, that's good. That's good Bible context. The donkey was literally like a Bentley. The horse was like a Prius. I mean, this is amazing. So Jesus was making a bold prophetic declaration and statement that he was the king of kings. Come on, somebody. That he was the Lord of lords. And in that moment, he chose to re reveal himself. In that moment, he chose to reveal himself to everyone of who he really was, the savior of mankind. And our prayer this weekend, my prayer as your pastor this weekend, is that the same revelation, that same moment where Jesus revealed himself as the savior, he would reveal his presence today in your life, in your marriage, in your life, in the middle of that struggle today, in the middle of that addiction, in the middle of that broken heart, in the middle of that emotional struggle, in the middle of that diagnosis or that physical issue. Our prayer today is that the supernatural hope and peace and the miracle working power that Jesus came in that day into Jerusalem is the same power we're encountering here today on April 2nd at 1120 AM. Come on, somebody. If you're believing for a miracle, say, I receive it. Come on, I receive it. I receive it. There's another point of interest. I said a moment ago, throwing cloaks in the path of someone was also an act of honor and submission. The people were recognizing Jesus as the promised Messiah, but unfortunately not with the right motives or hearts. My disposition, I said it a moment ago, and my posture is a little different today. It's less about stories and funny moments because we see this moment where the people are screaming, Hosanna, he's come. He's the one that raised Lazarus from the dead. That's the one we've heard about. He turns water into wine. This is the man that was born to Mary, the virgin. Like, I'm seeing it all unfolding in real time. But this is where the story turns to an interesting place because the people's cries of Hosanna which we see recorded in Psalms 118, verses 25 and 6. The definition of Hosanna means save now. It means to rescue. Instead of them recognizing him as the Messiah, which ultimately means the anointed one, despite everything Jesus had taught them about his mission, about one day dying on the cross, bringing healing, hope, and restoration to mankind, and then about his resurrection and the life that we would find in the finished work of the cross, people were instead not looking for Hosanna, Messiah, Savior. They were looking for a military Messiah. They were looking for someone who would overthrow the Romans and restore Israel's independence. They were not looking for Jesus, their Savior. They were looking for a militant Jesus, some sort of Rambo Jesus, <laughs> Some sort of MMA Jesus, like, here, here he came. I know he's on the donkey, that means peace, but get ready. He's about to wreck the room. Why? Because the crowds refused to see Jesus as he truly was, their Lord and Savior. Instead, they placed their personal desires on him. They acted out of an emotional place, out of a selfish place. So the same crowds who were shouting with joy and laying their cloaks down and waving their palm branches and shouting Hosanna, were the very same people a few days later on Thursday screaming, arrest that man, and on Friday screaming, crucify him. How quickly the mob and culture shifted. That's why it's so important to know why we believe what we believe. That's why it's so important to not get blown around with the tossing of the winds and the waves. That's why a few weeks ago I told my story of a friend named Ingolf Schmidt who was drug out into the middle of the street in Germany, telling him to shut down his secret underground church 
And his wife cried out, if you missed that sermon, and didn't say, Ingoff, deny Christ. Tell him we'll close the doors of the church. We don't have to do this anymore. No, instead she said, don't you dare do it. We've given up so much. Jesus is the only way. He's who will save and restore and heal. He's the only freedom we've experienced while this wall is standing. We get blown around by the winds and the waves, which is why we're moved by misinformation, which is why we have social media theologians teaching us about the Bible instead of being in the Word and actually being in church and a part of a community. We're allowing culture, I said it a moment ago, to dictate the boldness of Jesus, the boldness of the church of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you here at Hope City, we're pushing back. Come on, somebody. We're pushing. We're pushing back. I wrote this on my Instagram the other day. I got a few Got a few DMs about it. I said, more than ever, it seems that culture is getting more and more comfortable around tables that Jesus would want to flip over. We've just become so comfortable being okay, turning a blind eye to something that we know is not right. And instead of standing up and being bold because we're afraid of cancel culture and deconstructionists and all kinds of other people saying something, instead it's like, no, 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 no. Jesus rode in and got arrested and whipped and broken and beaten for my life and hung on a cross because he said I was valuable, because he said I was worth it, because he knows you by name. When others have forgotten your name, he knows you by name. Y'all are looking at me like a Methodist church. I need somebody to give God praise. Come on. No offense to the Methodist or the Pescatarians. Sorry, that's the Presbyterians. I apologize. Today's heavy. It is. If you walk with Jesus, you know how heavy this moment is. It's different than just a feel-good verse that says you're going to make it. Because I do believe you're going to make it. I do believe that 2023, even with the threat of recession and inflation and all that they're saying, it can still turn out to be the greatest year of your life. We do believe that. We have big faith here. Say, come on, say, we have big faith. But it's really important to know the foundation. Because in Matthew, Jesus paints this parable and says, the wind blew, the rain fell, the storm rose, and the man who built his house upon the rock, the house did not fall. But there was another man when the wind blew and the rain fell and the storms rose. That man built his house on the sand and his house collapsed because he was a foolish man. You have to know why you believe what you believe. It's not just about 59 seconds of fire devotional moments. You have to know why you believe what you believe. That's why we're a spirit-filled, life-giving, Bible foundation church where you're going to walk in one way and you're going to at least leave with the deposit so we can grow every day. Elbow the person next to you and say, I'm not going to stop growing. Come on. The difference that day made, the difference Palm Sunday into Good Friday into Easter, the difference these days made marked our Christianity in the history of time. So they're yelling, Hosanna, they're yelling, Messiah. And they shifted to crucify him. So my loaded question for all of you today is who is this Jesus to you? Make it personal. Who's this Jesus to you? Now I'm an Enneagram seven, wing eight. I love people. That's why we go out to the lobby every week. I love people. I want to hug everybody, high five everybody, fist bump everybody. I got handshakes with people like... I'm a seven. I love people. I talk to people in public. Some of you are like, I'm not that guy. And then the wing eight is I'm a challenger. There's a coach side of me. Uh, I talk to everybody. If I'm at the gas station and somebody's pumping gas, I talk to them. Like, hey, how are you doing? They're like, oh, stranger danger. Like, leave me alone, sir. Freaked me out a little bit. Well, the other day, uh, Shell Station by my house, there's one pump that has a little bit of a glitch where when you're trying to uh, lock it in with a little tab, uh, it flips back on you and smashes your finger. It's happened to me before, and it's no fun. And so I avoid that pump. I avoid it every single time. Well, I was getting gas at the pump across from it, and I hear a click, and I hear the guy yell, Jesus Christ, <laughs> really loud. Not the guy on the internet like, Jesus Christ, I love you, God. Not that guy. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? Jesus Christ, I love you, God. Not that guy. 
We should bring him on Easter. We should. <laughs> that guy. So I hear this guy yell this, and I said, hey, man, you good? He's like, yeah, I'm good. I said, were you praying? <laughs> this is the way I'm wired. He said, what? I said, were you, were you just praying? I, I want to pray for you. Sounds like you got hurt. He said, no, I wasn't praying. I said, oh, okay, because I heard you yell, Jesus Christ, really loud. <laughs> and he says to me, oh, bro, it's just a saying. And I felt my blood pressure rising. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 no. It's not just a saying. You just shouted out my Savior's name. And then I thought we were going to fight. I was. I was like, I'm going to end up on Houston Chronicle right now. <laughs> because we've dumbed him down to just a homeboy. We've dumbed him down to, I pinched my finger. I can just shout his name. It's not just another name. It's the name above every name. It's the name that mountains bow down to and oceans still roar to. It's the name that cancer bows to and other diseases and sicknesses. It's the name above every name. But we flippantly just use his name in vain. We flippantly just say his name. And so I just said, I can't be silent in these, in these moments. I wasn't trying to pick a fight, but he's, he's my savior. So who's Jesus to you? Is he someone who you want to satisfy your selfish needs, wants, and goals like they did that day that he came into Jerusalem? Like, I thought you were somebody that was going to throw overthrow all of this that we've been living in. Who is Jesus to you? Someone who's just satisfying your day-to-day -day needs where you pursue him like the glass box on the wall that says, break in case of emergency, or is he your Lord and Savior who actually gave up his life for you because he saw you as worth it? Who in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 says that your slate would be wiped clean, your sins thrown as far from the east as the west. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. You can know him as your personal Lord and Savior. I've said this before, but I feel like around this time of year, it's been stirring in me that if the only thing Jesus ever did was hang on the cross, it would have been enough. But he came to give us life, thank God, and life more abundantly, and his death, burial, and resurrection really did change Everything. I know for me it changed the entire trajectory of my life. But there was a season in my life when I wasn't really taking my faith that serious where Jesus was an accommodate me when I need you sort of Jesus. Does that shoe fit you? Who's Jesus to you? Is he a, I need a miracle in a moment, Jesus? Almost like a genie in the bottle, Jesus. Like a microwave miracle moment, Jesus, where like, okay, you can see, uh, obviously you're busy. I mean, there's lots that happening around the world, but can't you see, God, that my bills are stacking up? <laughs> Is heaven so busy that you can't help me with my money issues, God? I need a miracle in a moment. Can't you see that I need this fixed? And typically when we're in a, I need a miracle minute, Jesus, or a genie in the bottle, Jesus, we've goofed up pretty bad. How many of y'all have ever been there? Come on. I remember when uh, I was praying for, 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 for good weather, and uh, some of y'all have weather faith. And uh, I prayed for good weather, and the whole week we were in Florida while I was preaching at this conference, we had beautiful weather. Well, I didn't look at the weather the following week, but I had this whole moment set up, and uh, I, talk, I called to, to the hotel, and I talked to the manager. I said, hey, I want to extend the room a week. I extended uh, our, our, our rental car. I called and switched up our flights. I had roses delivered to the room. Jackie's like, you're so crazy. So <laughs> had this whole moment set up, and I said, babe, guess what? We're not working. We're not going to do anything. We're just going to play a whole week. She's like, are you kidding? I said, nope. Let's go eat. I already have reservations. She's like, let's go. We walk outside, and bloop, we feel this. What is that? And it's, this old guy off to the side, he's like, it's Florida, it's afternoon showers, it happens every day. And he's a liar, because it was 24 hours a day, 
for seven straight days. I didn't know a tropical storm was settling in to the Daytona Beach area, and y'all, it rain rained. We're on the third floor. It was raining. I'm looking at Jackie like, it says in Genesis 20 that God wouldn't flood the earth again. I need you to start praying, woman of God. Like, what's happening? We couldn't drive our car. It was stranded. I had to walk to a Domino's. There was pepperoni floating in the water. I was like, this can't be right. And the guy's like, I don't know, man. Here, and he just hands me this pizza. I go back. The box was so waterlogged. It was like bending. And Jackie's sitting on the bed. I'm sitting on the bed. And she got this crazy, like, y'all know what I'm talking about. It wasn't just like a, <laughs> she got this crazy laugh. She's like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, Lord. She said, I don't even remember what the sun looks like. And I was sitting there, and I was flustered and frustrated, and we didn't experience a fix-it, quick Jesus moment. But instead, we encountered a, God, let us grow through this and give us an opportunity to see something great in you moment. And I'm telling this story because three days, it ended up being one of the best bonding times. We had a blast Lots of adventures. We went to this one restaurant. We ended up learning everybody's names. We ended up ministering to people. I needed a fix it quick Jesus moment, but it's amazing how God in a moment, I know that's a little silly. Maybe yours is way deeper, a diagnosis or something that feels way heavier. So many times we pursue the presence of God when we're in a desperate place instead of a perpetual daily relationship with him where you feel the peace of God in the storm. We felt the peace of God in the midst of the storm because maybe he's also the, can't you see I'm in a hardship, Jesus? Can't you see I'm going through a really tough time? I need you to please work this out for me, God. I went to church two weeks in a row. I used to only go once, but I went two in a row. I even put a little money in the bucket. They put it on the news. I high-fived three people, and I know that last guy had the flu. I could see it. He had the sweats. I was just, can you show up? Maybe you only pursue him when you're in a hardship. Who's Jesus to you? Is he a quick stop Jesus? You only hang out with him when it's convenient? Like a Bucky's where you can get gas and apron, a rock shaped like Texas, brisket sandwiches and fudge? Some of y'all are like, it just made me hungry. It's Palm Sunday. Now, who is Jesus to you? Is he a, I only pursue because I have my own needs, my own wants, my own ambitions. Maybe you only spend time with him when it fits in your schedule. This convenient Jesus sort of relationship that only ends up being self-serving. I was talking to my kids. This may be super cheesy, and I may not say it in the next service. But I told my kids last night, I said, you know who Jesus isn't? He's not a Build-A-Bear Jesus. I said, when I walk into my daughter's room and I see a Build-A-Bear in the corner, it's funny because that's how we view Jesus sometimes. Like We make him what we want. We leave behind what we don't want assemble him perfect to our liking. We place him in the corner of the room and allow him to be a little bit of a decoration in our life. Somebody might say about you, oh, that's Daniel. I think he's a Christian. But the truth is, that's not the Jesus that I serve at all. He's not just an accessory we place in a corner. He's the space and the place that we live with him. It says that in him we live, we move, and we breathe. Who is Jesus to you? Because when we live in Christ, you'll experience his peace. You'll experience hope and joy. You'll experience the fruit of the Spirit that we talked about during our evidence series. When we live in Christ and we live fully in Him, you will carry out and walk out that type of relationship that when you go through the fire, you come out not smelling like smoke and your clothes aren't burned up. Experience Director Josh Zilch here. Josh Zilch got into a pretty substantial car wreck yesterday. He has a huge, big white truck. A guy ran a red light, hit him at 60, and his truck flipped multiple times. Now, Josh is big. You'll see him in the lobby. He's, built, he's like a Sasquatch. Like, he's a big dude. Makes me look small. Like, Josh is the man. He's like a football player. And I called him while he was in the hospital. Our team was on it, man. We were on like a NASCAR pit crew, man. Our prayer team, our pastors, we were there. And I called him, and I said, he said, man, the, the big, great white truck has fallen. I said, yeah, it has. He said, man, the guy clipped me, jumped out of his car and ran. And if that was you, turn yourself in. We're going to pray for you today. Amen. If you, <laughs> amen. But I said, you know what's amazing, Josh, is we all pray to be delivered from the fire. Sometimes we're delivered inside of the fire. And I said, your shirt doesn't smell like smoke. Your clothes aren't burned up. 
and all the CT scans and x-rays, you're going to walk out of that hospital. And about two hours later, he texts me. He said, Pastor Daniel, I've got clear CT scans. My x-rays are good, and I don't smell like smoke. My clothes weren't burned up. But he prayed for protection. He lives under the shadow of the Almighty God. In a fallen world, we're going to deal with some stuff. So who's Jesus to you? Is he... I'm trying to survive this life, Jesus. Who is he to you? Maybe he's your gold chain, Jesus. Like an accessory, you just kind of put him on like your church clothes, and then you take him off and put him in a corner and put on your club clothes. Just kind of put it on and take it off. His presence, you just kind of act like you can kind of hide it in a corner for different scenarios and different people you hang with. Just something that you pick up to see if it fits. The goal is not to wear him around like an accessory, but instead to live again in relationship with him because he'll take you places that you've never dreamed of. He'll carry you into positions of purpose and ultimately leave a legacy through your life on this earth because you did it in his strength, not your own. So ask yourself across all the campuses, is he my cosmetic gold chain Jesus? Where again, I can just put him on and take him off like a jacket and you decipher who you're going to be around your church friends versus your club friends? Who's Jesus to you? And just let me be really clear. This is going to step on somebody's toes today. The Holy Spirit doesn't go outside and wait in the Uber when you're acting out. He doesn't go outside and wait in the Uber when you're acting out. His presence is always present. Which is why the closer you get to his heart, the more the things that used to pull you away from God are no longer enticing to you. Come on, somebody. God can't use who you pretend to be. And I'm grateful that he's not looking for perfect, but he's looking for our heart. Who is this Jesus to you? So the Bible describes him as a friend closer to a brother, a father to the fatherless, our refuge and strength, our very present help in a time of need. For me personally, my family didn't need a genie in a bottle Jesus. We didn't need a quick stop, convenient Jesus. We didn't need an accessory gold chain Jesus to hang out with my dad, to have a beer with him. We needed the King of Kings. We needed the Lord of Lords. We needed the Messiah, Hosanna, the one who gave his life for my alcoholic, drug-induced, womanizing father who was trying to literally derail our entire family, but because of one encounter with the Savior, one encounter with the Anointed One, one encounter with the person of Jesus, it changed and broke the back of the enemy in our lives. So today, for me, my posture is different because as I celebrate Palm Sunday, the day that Jesus arrived to Jerusalem leading up to the most powerful moments that completely freed each and every one of us, this Friday is different for me. This Good Friday where Jesus was crucified. Here's my challenge. I want you to take a moment, not just get up. Some of y'all are like, yeah, I got Friday off. My, 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 my job just gave it to me. It's crazy. Even, even pagan bosses sometimes will give you a Friday off on Good Friday. Or maybe your boss is a Christian. But, but this Friday, I want you to wake up. Don't just business as usual. I want you to take a moment, get on your knees before God and thank him. Lift your hands towards heaven, even if you have to go hide in your closet and just lift your hands and say, if it wasn't for the blood, if it wasn't for redemption, if it wasn't for the price that you paid, I wouldn't be breathing right now because in you I breathe. In you I'm about to take a step. In you I'm about to live out this day that you have made. So I will rejoice and be glad in it. This Friday, please accept the challenge. and Don't just dismiss it as another day. On Saturday, before you fire up the barbecue and do all the stuff that we do on Saturdays, that day of silence, I want you to take a moment. If you have kids, teach them. In the Bible, this was a silent day when people doubted and wondered what was going to happen. But y'all, it's a setup because tomorrow he will rise and we will celebrate the resurrection of our king. So I ask you this question again. Who is this Jesus to you? I was watching NCAA tournament yesterday, UConn versus San Diego State. I don't know who, some of y'all are like, who cares? <laughs> I got UConn. No offense to San Diego State. 
but there was a guy holding a sign. We've all seen it at almost every sporting event. Even underwater basket weaving, they'll hold this sign up. John 3, 16, we know it's on the screens. For God so loved the world that he gave his, his one and only son. That whoever, come on, somebody shout out loud, I'm a whoever. Come on, elbow the person next to me and say they're talking about you. That whoever, doesn't matter what your money looks like, it doesn't matter how old you are, what your skin color is, whoever, whosoever, every single one of us, Genesis 127, created in his image that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. I'm grateful on this Palm Sunday and in future generations that we can preach that Christianity is not about behavior modification. I'm grateful that Christianity isn't just about surviving life, it's about a heart transformation so that we can all walk out our purpose and fulfill the assignment and reflect Jesus to others. So my final question in closing today, on this Palm Sunday, is he the king of your life? Who is this Jesus to you? Is he the king of your heart? Crowds went from chanting Hosanna the ones that were in front of him and the ones that followed him went from Messiah to crucify him. I can only imagine if it existed then what the social media scene would have been like back then. The mobs jump on bandwagons to try to discredit and try to divide all the miracles and all the signs and all the wonders that they had seen. I don't know, for some of you today or maybe you're watching online or one of our other campuses, it's easy to listen and hear me read through these scriptures Maybe it hasn't fully resonated or fully connected just yet. Because Pastor Daniel, it's just a story, right? It's just words on a page, right? Our creative team put something together. I think it could have maybe sounded probably something like this. we approach your presence in a posture of humility. Forgive us, God, for ever making this an accommodate me sort of Jesus moment. An accessory miracle in a moment. Genie in a bottle, Jesus. A build a bear, Jesus, where we accessorize and build you the way we want. Forgive us for ever dumbing you down. For ever taking your name in vain forever dismissing you as anything other than our Savior. With our hands lifted, open-handed, with your eyes closed, not worrying about anybody around you, who is this Jesus to you? Is he the king of your heart? Because his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Light of the world. There's freedom in his name. Awesome in power, reigning forever, light of the world, this free, come on, sing it out, say, say, his name is Jesus.
with your hands down, eyes closed just for a moment. If you're here today on Palm Sunday, I said this a moment ago, but maybe something in your heart today is convincing you of the fact that today is different. You feel the presence of God and you would say, Daniel, here's the truth. I don't know Jesus as my savior, but I want to. Who is Jesus to me? Honestly, nobody. Because I don't know him like you've been talking about, but I want to. Here at Hope City, we don't pray prayers for symbolic reasons. We don't pray prayers just to pray them. We're praying according to the word in Romans 10, verse nine and 10. We're gonna confess with our mouth in a moment and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord and everything is about to change. Or maybe you're the second invitation. You would say, Daniel, I got caught up in the prodigal life. I've been living reckless. I've been living for me. But the truth is today on Palm Sunday, I wanna come back home like the prodigal son waiting to get a robe and a ring. I wanna come back home today. I'm gonna to count to three and with boldness at Woodlands, Katie, if you're saying yes to Jesus today, age crew online, you can say yes, our team will help you. But in the room at West Houston, an additional seat, and when I hit three, I want you to boldly lift up your hand if you wanna give your life to Jesus for the first time. One, two, I wanna rededicate my life. Three, if that's you, lift up your hand, I'm looking. I see you, 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 and you, and you, and you, and you. I see you waving at me, I see you. Come on, I see you, I see you. You can put your hands down. Come on, Hope City, can we give God praise for all the people that said, today's my day. Who is Jesus to you? It's our Lord and our Savior. Come on, repeat this prayer. Maybe you didn't lift your hand. God saw your hand, he didn't have to see, he saw your heart, he didn't have to see your hand. For all those who did lift their hands, I want you to pray and everybody else with boldness, say this out loud, Jesus, it's me. From today on, I'm choosing to live for you. Thank you for your journey into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, getting arrested, crucified for my life, even though I didn't deserve it. And then thank you for getting up out of that grave on the third day so that I could experience freedom and walk in the life that you've called me to walk in. I repent for every sin, all my struggles, and I ask for your forgiveness. From this moment on, I choose to live for you. You are my Father. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, hope to give God praise.